Everybody loves a race, and cross-country skiers are no different. One of the most exciting of all amateur ski races is the annual triathlon ski race, otherwise known as the Energy Crisis Race. It is a grueling, challenging event that requires stamina, as well as the ability to perform superbly on cross-country skis, 10-speed bicycles, and fast-running kayaks, where the race ends with entrants shooting the white waters of the California Truckee River. Preparation is, of course, a must. Waxing, some kidding, bibs on right. Finally, the skiers are ready. They've received their instructions. The race begins. see how this race progresses, let's take a look at the basics of cross-country skiing. One of America's fastest growing sports, cross-country skiing can be one of the most enjoyable family and individual sports you'll ever experience. A variety of equipment is available, and skiers usually develop their own style, as we shall see when our race progresses. To begin, Jerry Smeltzer, co-director with Skip Reedy of the Nordic Ski Center at Squaw Valley, USA, will show us the various skis in use by cross-country skiers today. The first ski shown has built-in fish scales. It's designed to be a non-wax ski. This model allows forward progress in all conditions and on all terrain with ease. It also allows the skier to walk up a slope without slipping backwards. Next, the mohair ski. Mohair will stand up, bristling at the slightest backward movement, allowing the skier, much as he could with a fish scale, to move forward or climb with little effort. The most popular ski in use is the wooden standard. This all-wood, light touring ski with a lignostone edge has been and still is the standard for the cross-country skier. Wood skis require special pine tar preparation prior to initial use. You're probably familiar with this heavy metal fiberglass alpine ski and its boot-grabbing safety binding. P-Tex based, these skis hardly ever require, or for that matter, hold a coat of wax. In contrast, they are heavier, wider, and in recent years, shorter than the long, light touring skis of the Nordic fan. Mountaineering ski equipment is the closest to alpine skiing cross-country will get. Here, a heavy wood ski with metal edge and Silverado binding are shown. The Silverado binding allows the skier to lock down for downhill skiing in the backcountry and loosen the boot for normal ski touring. Here we see the differences between the downhill ski pole and the cross-country or Nordic pole. The tip of the cross-country pole is bent slightly to assist it in coming out of the snow as the skier is moving forward. There have been stories of skiers working very hard to straighten this slight tip bend, not realizing fully that this is why the tip was so designed. Cross-country skiing is as comfortable and natural as walking. The grips reflect more of the cross-country comfort. Handles are straight, not grooved as the alpine pole. And because of the style of skiing, the angles differ between the use of the cross-country and the alpine ski pole while skiing. The cross-country pole is always trailing, while the alpine is almost always planted alongside the skier at each turn. Prior to skiing, checking the snow temperature and applying the wax for that day is a must. A hard blue wax used here is needed for a snow temperature of between 20 and 30 degrees. The wax should be applied over the entire ski and as heavily as the skier prefers. Then, with a cork, the wax should be warmed and rubbed into the wood, actually making it a part of the ski. A wax application such as this should last for a full day of skiing, unless, of course, the temperature changes. It should be remembered that all cross-country skis require a base and wax preparation, more so than alpine skis. 
Low cross-country ski boots invite white powdery snow into the skier's socks and shoes. Nylon protectors called alligators, as shown here, are used effectively to protect the skier. For light touring and cross-country skiing, bindings are generally the standard three-pin toe-mounting variety. Holes drilled in the toe of the boot match the three pins of the binding. Mounted toward the rear of the binding is a heel plate device designed to reduce the amount of snow on top of the ski, directly under the foot. To mount the boot and ski, place the boot into the binding, push down with a bale, and you're ready to go. Your heel should have complete up and down movement, as far forward as you can bend your foot and clear back to the heel plate. Body position now becomes very important. Head up, not down. When skiing cross country, keep your head up, back straight while glide walking, downhilling, and even while snow plowing. And snow plowing is a very important part of cross country skiing. Remember to keep the inside edge against the snow, skis canted, pushing on them as though they were the bow of a boat going through water. To increase pressure on the skis, lower the knees to the snow affecting greater pressure on the skis and slowing the skier down, offering more control while going downhill. Remember, in cross-country skiing, you'll be touring in a lot of areas that have not been pre-packed. The snowplow will become a welcomed friend, helping control not only your speed, but also your direction. While moving uphill, the back, as before, should be straight, with the head erect. The angle of the leg should be such that the knee is barely in front of the ankle. The skis should make solid contact with the snow. The camber of the ski forced down onto the snow to make the wax work, using your body weight positively. The ski does not progress when off the snow. As demonstrated here, your poles should always be behind your boots while moving uphill. This is the wrong way. Here, our skier is forcing the skis back because his body weight is forward. Instead, his ski should be out front, his back and head erect. With body position understood, you should then practice your new techniques on the flatter, more level surfaces. Imagine the skier's body turning now, very much like a wheel. In other words, a rhythm of motion must be learned. Of the two basic methods for skiing, the flat diagonal stride that is using the opposite arm from the leg you will glide on is the most often used. The angle of the ski pole, demonstrated here clearly, helps the skier in forcing his skis forward. In some instances, however, you can use double poling, a technique of poling with both arms simultaneously, keeping the skis parallel, like runners on a sled. The diagonal technique, or glide walking, is an excellent conditioner, both for the physique of the skier and for developing the balance needed for smooth skiing. When using poles, don't grip them hard as in alpine skiing. Doing so will tire you rapidly. Relax, hold them loosely, remember to remain comfortable. Poling is very important, but not for power. To realize the value of the poles, practice some runs without them, here and later on a hill. Your poling motion should be smooth, loose, and very rhythmical, and most important, timed with the forward knee drive. The most important thing here is the knee drive. The power here will separate the very good skiers from all the others. Achieve smooth, effective glide walking. Simply drive your left or right leg forward with your opposite arm doing the same. Emphasize the drive of the forward knee. You'll find your arm working quite naturally. Remember, extend the trailing arm behind you, pushing backward in the snow, allowing the pole, when in use, to pull free of the snow as you progress forward. Group touring becomes a welcome sight at the beginning of your new cross-country education. It's not long, however, before we all yearn to tackle the mountains, the untapped, unexplored, untracked, powdery hillsides. 
To get to the top of a hill, cross-country skiers must ski up. And skiing uphill is a dynamic move, requiring total commitment. It also becomes a style for each skier. It is fair to say that experienced cross-country skiers who climb hills regularly are probably stronger than alpine counterparts. This and proper waxing provide the requirements for a successful uphill effort. When the snow changes temperature, the skis will slide or slip, as demonstrated here. But the skier should make every effort to continue his climb. Once stopped, the rhythm is lost. The effort required becomes much more. The timing, the machinery, the balance has to be working for the skier all the time if the top is his goal. While moving uphill, the poles are behind the boots, the line of the leg always placing the knees just forward of the ankle. Arms should be extended, all four extremities now working. Extended arms allow the upper body to relax while full movement of the legs with the proper posture keep the torso and although working all the time, the legs relaxed. Another way to achieve the success of reaching the top is with the herringbone maneuver, so-called because of the pattern it leaves in the snow. With the herringbone, the poles are behind the skier to support him in his climb. Legs and arms should alternate, just as with the diagonal, only here there's no glide, and you must dig in the inside edge of the skis. Turning around to face the opposite direction from which a skier has come can at times be quite difficult. To achieve this, the skier should learn and practice the kick turn. First, the skier must lift his knee, placing the tail of his turning ski to the tip of the stationary ski, and without hesitating, let the ski fall back parallel to the second ski. The skier should be careful to ensure he does not cross the ski tail over the tip of the other ski. The pole from the turning side should at this time follow the ski. Should the skier become unstable, both poles are then in place to help him regain his balance. For downhill running, place the ski poles back, hands to the knees. Weight is evenly distributed on both skis, with skis flat on the snow. If during a run out, stopping becomes a problem, the easiest way to save the run is to simply sit down, or fall down. To get back onto skis, crossed ski poles serve as an anchor in the snow. Simply press down on them while placing weight on the downhill ski. Push up and presto, you're ready to go. Now that you're on a hill, practice a few runs without the poles. You'll find it improves your skiing technique as well as being a lot of fun. If you're an ice skater, you'll notice a great deal of similarity between the two sports. Smoothness counts and body position is always important. Arms and legs extended, the changing of balance coordinated. As here, Note how Jerry's right hand is thrown forward, his right leg back, weight on his left leg and ski. Now with the poles in hand again, our skier moves up a slight slope. Knees are slightly forward of ankles. Poles are allowed to extend fully before returning to forward position. The balance of the skier is noticeably excellent. The wheel is turning, the motions are smooth. He's relaxed and therefore expending a minimum of energy to move up the mountain. Skiing in the mountains through untracked snow, you always come across obstacles, and getting around them can at times prove uneasy. The skate, or step turn, is the most useful method of changing direction, and in any kind of condition, on most all skis. Simply raise one ski slightly off the snow, aim it in the direction you want to go, place it back down on the snow, lift the other, and while transferring your weight, 
bring it alongside the first ski. The faster you're skiing, the quicker you have to be with the skis. These then have been the basics of cross-country skiing. The skis, the bindings and wax, the boots and poles and the techniques of glide walking, herringbone climb, snow plowing, step turning, proper poling. Accomplish these and you'll naturally progress to the more advanced techniques and they'll come quickly. Before charging off into the woods, however, we should discuss briefly the necessity of preparation for any overnight or full day tours. On long cross-country treks, especially during the spring days, you'll probably shed your parka. If so, at least carry it with you in a backpack or around your waist. Don't count on the weather remaining either clear or warm. Most new lightweight down parkas will fit in any of the newer light backpacks created for mountain climbers and cross-country skiers. In addition, new ripstop nylon goose down or duck down or dacron sleeping bags are available and these too pack easily, usually tying at the bottom of a backpack. These bags will generally weigh around five pounds. Lightweight tents are also available and if you're planning an overnighter, you or your skiing partner can carry a tent, which is also tied to the backpack. Tents come in varying sizes, designs, and offer protection against storms and cold weather. They each have a purpose, and you should try them all before investing in one. They're lightweight, but expensive. These tents weigh anywhere from five to 10 pounds each. Each tent is designed for two people. Also, tents come for various types of outdoor conditions, from the very sub-zero to the springtime warm weather. Make sure before investing in any one of these tents, such as the three shown here, that you know exactly what snow conditions you expect to encounter. Before joining our racers again, one last word of caution. Skis do break. To save a long walk back to your camp or car, lightweight plastic ski shovels are available. When the ski breaks, simply place the shovel over the tip and you can ski once again. Well, right where we left them. Now watch the skiers really jump on those skis. They're racing and they know every motion counts, yet they are still balanced, smooth, and very much in control of their progress. have to shed their skis and run for a mile to bicycles. they climb into kayaks and ride the white waters of the Truckee to the River Ranch Hotel at Alpine Meadows, a grueling race open to all amateurs. A race demonstrates that cross-country skiers are usually in excellent physical condition. How physically fit are they? Well, in this race, the entrance age level ran from the youngest at 12 years to the oldest at 51. And the winner? He was a 41-year-old architectural draftsman. Country skiing, it's really quite natural. How about it? Think you're ready?